Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everybody. It is my honor to introduce to you Dr. Fuller and Colowell. Um, I'm a big fan of Fuller. He was my mentee for about a year here in Oklahoma and he's brilliant. So when we reached out to him to give a talk today, um, I was really excited that he accepted. So it's an honor to have you here, Fola. I'm gonna introduce you and then I will let you take over. Um, so Dr. Kolowo, he obtained a bachelor in geology from the Federal University of Technology in Akira, Nigeria in 2008. After that, he worked in the oil and gas industry before he relocated to the US to continue his graduate education. He earned his Master of Science at Oklahoma State University in 2017. He did a lot of research on the Eastern African Rift System and the seismogenic crustal deformation, both, both in active rifts and interplate settings. And then he obtained a PhD from the University of Oklahoma in geophysics. And there he investigated the role of structural inheritance and injection, induced seismicity, and active tectonics. And he worked for BP for about two years as an exploration structural geologist. And this summer, he's actually going to be moving to New York. He is a, going to be a tenure track assistant professor of structural geology at Columbia University. And when he's not doing some great science work, he loves spending time with his family, rock climbing, hiking, and camping outdoors. So lots of fun things that a lot of us geos love. So Fola, I will pass it on to you and let you take over. Awesome, thank you, Molly. I'm gonna share my screen. Perfect. Right. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, looks great. All right. Perfect. All right. Um, I'll go ahead. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for um, thanks to the APG PSGD leadership team for inviting me to talk about my research. Uh, the title of my talk today is Hiding in Plain Sight small throw basement rooted faults and the induced seismicity of the Anadarko Basin. And again, my name is Fola and Kolawali. These are the names of the host of people that have contributed to the studies that I'll be sharing with you, um, sharing, showing to you today. And since Molia has already um, given you a sorry, summary of my career journey, I'm just gonna skip this part. So the sudden spike in seismicity in central and eastern US since about 12 years now has been attributed to um, increased injection of saline wastewater into the sedimentary formations, uh, which has led to seismic reactivation of previously unknown faults. And most of these um, faults are within the basement. You can see this anomalous clustering of events um, within the basement um, and relatively less rupture of faults within the sedimentary cover. The earthquake source mechanisms show that the, uh, um, that the mechanism of reactivation is primarily um, strike slip with minor normal and reverse components. Over the years of studying this problem, um, we can summarize that the main driving mechanisms are primarily four. Uh, one is the direct pore pressurization from zones of injections into fault. So you have um, a seismic reactivation of the fault closer to the zone of high pressurization, and then you can have seismicity ahead of the front of the uh, uh, pore pressure diffusion. And we also have um, other mechanisms which are uh, primarily remote um, uh, styles of, 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 of fault reactivation. Essentially, uh, we, we have we've seen evidence of porothermoelastic stress transfer from zones of um, high rate and high volume of injection. So essentially you have fault a far field being reactivated by poor elastic stresses that are propagating outwards. We've also seen many examples of Coulomb stress, uh, of Coulomb static stress transfer from a zone of initial rupture, um, you know, transferring static stresses out, outboard into fault that are pre-stressed, but are within the sphere of influence of the static stress transfer. And studies have also showed that we can have interplay of all these three driving the pattern of seismicity. 
at regional scale, it appears that there are certain subregions within Central and Eastern US that are that are um, localizing more widespread seismicity than other areas. These areas are primarily Oklahoma and central Illinois basin. Also um, recent <clears throat> increase in deployment of, you know, of instruments around West Texas has been showing that there's a lot of seismicity also happening here. But over time and on a regional scale, it appears that Anadaco basin and Illinois basins are pretty much more susceptible to widespread induced seismicity. So now let's zoom into Oklahoma. Um, here is a map of Oklahoma showing um, the general tectonic provinces or um, 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 domains. Um, and we see that most of the earthquakes, which are shown here in red circles, are clustering within the Anadaku shelf and a little bit in um, um, the western part of the Cherokee platform. But we also have a lot of events in the Anadaku Basin and in the Akoma Basin. These shelf areas are primarily, and I'll show this in the following slides, they are primarily the um, shallower sections of the flexure of the Anadaku Basin and the Akoma Basin. <clears throat> and here in central Oklahoma, the earthquakes are within um, what we call the stack and the scoop place. So we can, we can associate um, um, the events to activities within the stack and the scoop. And right here is where today's, um, the study I'll be showing you today is focused on. So a little bit on the tectonic history and the geology of the, of the study area. Um, at regional scale, this area has undergone multiple phases of deformation. And I will start from the basement and, and then come up in time. So the basement is dominated by what we call the Southern Granite Trilite Province, which is a Mesoproterozoic, Mesoproterozoic granitic um, terrain that stretches from, um, from, eastern, uh, from Western Texas all the way through Oklahoma and down here into Northern Louisiana. Um, this basement was in place during the accretion of, of, um, of, of Northern America in the Mesoproterozoic. But after the emplacement of this basement, we had um, the mid-continent rifting sometime around um, 1.1 giga -an, which is shown here in the creamed or yellow polygon. It's not very clear that the mid-continent rift extends into Oklahoma. Um, there's still a lot of studies going on in this area, but from a regional perspective, this basement experienced deformation during that time. And after the mid-continent rifting, we had another episode of rifting around late Proterozoic to early, um, to early Cambrian, um, primarily in the south here, which is associated with um, a breakup of, of, of the supercontinent at the time, Laurentia. And after this rifting you know, failed, uh, well, the rifting was successful in the south here, but we have um, a segment of the rift that propagated into the continent, which is right here. And that's what we call the Southern Oklahoma or Lacogen because it is a field harm of that um, rift margin. But after this rift, um, this rifting phase stopped, the entire um, region of Oklahoma started to undergo post-rift um, thermal subsidence, which is you know, what we can call post-rift SAG. Uh, between the Ordovician of the same middle Mississippian. And that led to the deposition of thick sequences of carbonates and you know, siliciclastic um, rocks, sedimentary rocks. But right at the latest uh, uh, Paleozoic, we had another uh, episode of tectonic compression that impacted the old region. And that even led to the reactivation of several faults within the area and also um, inversion and uplift of the Southern Oklahoma Lacogen. And that event uh, is associated with the downward flexure of the basement right on the flank of the uplifted um, Olacogen and that allowed the deposition of thick sequences during the late Paleozoic. So th these key events are pretty important because they tell us the history of the fault that we're gonna be looking at today. You know, the possible history that explains the deformation of the basement within the region of seismicity and the emplacement of the faults that have been reactivated. So the Anadaku Basin itself, um, which formed, you know, we, we can think of Anadaku Basin 
as primarily the section of the sedimentary cover that formed um, during the late Paleozoic. But typically, if we're talking about the deformation, the fault systems, we it's important to look at the old section from you know the late Paleozoic all the way down into the basement. And here, um, I want to highlight the what has been observed in terms of the uh, 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 the, the deformation that impacted the Anadako Basin when it was subsiding. Um, several studies, uh, particularly Toko Mitra and Liao et al. Uh, Liao et al. 2017, Chopra et al. 2018, have showed the presence of strike slip fault systems within the Anadako Basin. Uh, Toko Mitra did a really good job, you know, compiling huge data sets of, you know, seismic data that are well constrained by whales. And they show that during the development of the Anadarko Basin, during that downward flexure, the, the regional stresses can be um, subdivided into two orientations, an older one that is northeast, southwest. So essentially, we had the initial compression from the northeast, which rotated um, later um, into approximately east-west direction. And this can be attributed to the southward propagation of the Appalachian um, Wachita Marathon orogenic belt in the south. And within the um, basin itself, there, there's been you know, these studies that highlighted the presence of strike slip structures within the sedimentary cover <clears throat> and are drift rooted into the basement. And we see, see them here in the sedimentary cover. Uh, these structures have been modeled um, you know, from analog pass, pass, uh, approaches, which does show that you can reproduce those structures um, in a transpersonal sense. So essentially, we can infer that the study area that we're going to be looking at today here in southern Oklahoma um, has accommodated significant transpersonal faulting during the late Paleozoic, and that can explain um, the, or the kinematics of the faults that, that we're going to be looking at. And I'm establishing that because it's difficult to see kinematics in faults that have very little throw. You know, it can be very difficult. So um, in terms of the seismicity <clears throat> and the inherited structures that are being reactivated, um, there are two major problems. One is the limited understanding of the pre-existing structure of the basement itself in um, central Oklahoma. Prior to all the seismicity, there was really no motivation to better understand the, the basement structure. Um, oftentimes, uh, and the second issue is that oftentimes the, these potentially unstable faults are difficult to image in seismic. Um, it's, it's been a big problem in the region because a lot of companies do wish to know if faults are within an area they are exploring in so that it can avoid them during drilling or stimulation or injection. But in many cases, it's pretty difficult to identify this fault prior to, to drilling and injection. And I'll be highlighting results from our studies that pinpoint one of the major reasons why they are difficult to, to see. So the key science questions that we address in this studies are three. One is, what is the detailed structure of the seismogenic basement of the Anadarko Basin Shelf? And the second is, what is the structure and origin of the basement rooted faults in the region of seismicity? So first, the basement itself, and second, the faults that are rooted into the basement. And third, what is the implication of this inherited fault geometries and structure for injection-induced seismicity? And um, to address these important questions, we analyze seismic reflection data that are constrained by um, well data within the, within the area. And I integrated this, the observations in seismic reflection data with field observations and core samples and recordings, uh, simply because within the region of the study, the basement is buried you know, pretty deep and you'll see it in the seismic data. But, um, in other parts of the basin, we do have core samples. And within the study area, we have drill cuttings um, of basement penetration wells. And far in Southern Oklahoma, this particular basement comes up to the surface where we can actually see deformation within the basement and relate what we observe on the field to what we observe in seismic data. So a little bit on the seismic data set itself. So again, the region of study is right here in Central Oklahoma. Kingfisher County. And I, I was very lucky to, got, to get access to this beautiful 3D seismic survey uh, provided by TGS. Um, 
And this data is a 3D post up time aggregated seismic volume. Uh, we converted it to depth using um, sonic logs from, from the well data, uh, from the wells within the region. And um, we estimate the vertical resolution of this data to be about 21 meters within the Mississippian level. And our depth in the basement, you know, simply because you lose energy um, of seismic waves um, as, as they propagate into the, into, the, um, into the subsurface during seismic acquisition, you typically get lower resolution at depth. And it wasn't surprising that our estimate came out to be about 27 meters in the basement. But overall, uh, we consider this data to be high quality data um, enough to um, investigate the questions that we care about. And the zones of interest are the shallower um, sedimentary sections up to the lower part of the Mississippian down into the basement. So question one, what is the detailed structure of this seismogenic basement? Here is a section from the 3D seismic volume that I worked on. And what we see here are uh, you know, two levels. One is a shallower package where we see relatively continuous um, sub-horizontal reflectors, a very prominent boundary beneath that package and a deeper section where we see prominent um, deep in systematic sets of high amplitude reflectors. Um, in some places they cross, they cross cut one another, but they do not offset um, one another and they all terminate at the top basement uh, reflector, which is that prominent reflector that separates the shallower package from the deeper one. So this is the basement that we're talking about and the broad fabrics that we can see are two, but this is the first one that I'm highlighting, this you know, deep in reflectors. We can call them intra-basement reflectors, IBRs. And the second, um, fabric or deformation that we can observe in seismic within this basement level is what I'll call D2. The first one is D1. And these are the subvertical discontinuities that cross cut or offset the IBRs. There are some of these discontinuities that terminate. They also terminate at the top basement. Some terminate within the basement, but in most places, these subvertical discontinuities do extend up into the sedimentary cover and it also offsets and deform the sedimentary sequences. So what are these two broad categories of deformation that we can see in the basement? First, the IBRs. Um, I need to mention that these IBRs are in, what, again, intra-basement reflectors. IBRs are not limited to Oklahoma. They've actually been observed in other parts of the granite rhyolite province itself, you know, other parts of the extent of this basement. Um, so here is an example from the Illinois basin where um, studies have also imaged um, the basement and highlighted the presence of intra basement reflectors. In Southeast Texas, uh, Southwest Texas, there also, there's, there's also been reports of um, intra basement reflectors within the basement. And right here in Northern Texas, um, just near the southern um, tip of the southern Granite Rally province. There's also been studies, there are two studies by Fund um, that he shared with me, and I, I was so excited to see that, you know, they had, they were also able to observe intra reflectors within um, that part of the Granite Rally province. So what do we think these things are? Luckily, within our study area, we have a well that penetrates the basement, and here are wireline logs from this well. And here is our forward model of the, of the seismogram. And what we see is that, uh, so right here is the marker for the top basement. And we do see a clear deflection of the gamma ray resistivity and sonic logs right at that um, level. But as we come down into the basement, there are excursions from the baseline um, um, signature of the basement, of this granitic basement. There are excursions that suggest that there exists um, another layering within the basement that is different from the host granite itself. Uh, I was lucky to have access to drill cuttings from that same well. And this one, which you call sample A, is from this shallower interval. So between the top basement and this first intra basement layer or whatever it is. And we have another one, sample B, from 
is um, within that zone of excursion and another one from a deeper depth. And what we see is that sample A, you know, is composed of light colored minerals. Sample B is pretty dark relative to sample A and relative to sample C. Sample C is not as light colored as sample A, but it's still relatively light col colored compared to sample B. And we did XRD and XRF um, analysis on the samples and the results show clearly that this, the material that dominates this interval of excursion here, and most likely this other little spike here, is composed of mythic minerals, primarily um, amphiboles. And this suggests that um, we're li we likely have a mythic intrusion here, right within that interval. Um, our interpretation, so not just amphibole, we also have high plagioclase um, within it. I should, I should mention that. But it, it, it also suggests that we're likely looking at igneous intrusions within the granitic basement, primarily diabase intrusions. I don't think it's gabbroic. It's most likely gab, um, um, diabase based on the geochemistry of the geocodons. And in Southern Oklahoma, where I did a lot of work during my PhD at Oklahoma, um, here is what the basement actually looks like. We're talking about the same basement of the Southern Granite Wildlife Province where it is exposed at the surface in Southern Oklahoma. What we see are all those you know, huge bands of dark colored rocks that intrude the basement. And these are diabetes seals. There's been a few studies on them and they've also been dated to show um, late Proterozoic. And I think there's, this, there's an age from early um, Cambrian. Um, within the mix of ages, but they are they are primarily late Proterozoic to early Cambrian. So it um, uh, actually extends into Mesoproterozoic. Yeah, some of the ages show Mesoproterozoic origin also. So in terms of the ages, it's not clear whether these intrusions in the basement are related to the emplacement of the Granitrilite province, like during the accretion of the, of the terrains in the Mesoproterozoic, or if they are, intrusions related to the mid-continent rift propagation into the south, you know, towards the south into central Oklahoma, or if they are related to the Cambrian rifting, you know, that led to the um, development of the southern Oklahoma Olacogen before it failed. It's, it's not clear. However, one thing we know is that disintrabismary reflectors are intrusions. The alternative interpretation could have been that there are shear zones within the basement because there are other parts of the world, like in, in North Sea, where there is clear evidence that there are intrabasement reflectors in seismic data. And from um, different types of analysis, the, the consensus is that there are shear zones. There are ductile shear zones that have been exhumed um, in the basement, but we don't think that is the case here. So first we've been able to characterize what D1 represents. And D2, in the exposures of the basement, uh, again in southern Oklahoma, we see a lot of subvertical faults that have been intruded by diabase. Um, and it's pretty obvious that those discontinuities are where fault based on the geometries of the splays that you see on both sides, because it's difficult to see markers of offset. But, uh, and we've also seen evidence of slicking lines on some of the samples that dropped from the walls of the faults um, um, within the quarry. So we think that these sort of vertical discontinuities that cut the intrabismary reflectors and even control the emplacement of some of them, because we see intrusions along it, um, are faults that were emplaced initially in the basement, but then they were reactivated again. Um, and you know they were they must definitely be dilating us at the time that the intrusions um, were emplaced within them. So we can interpret that this intrabasement um, D2 deformations represent faults that are either basement bounded or have been reactivated and are propagated up into the sedimentary cover. And um, here is a seismic section um, across the old data set you know, from the surface to um, about deeper than eight kilometers into the basement, or this, this is between six and eight kilometers, so this is probably like 8.5 kilometers into the basement. Um, and here is the top basement reflector right there. Right here is a fault that cuts through the basement and deforms the top basement and extends up into the sedimentary cover, which I called fault F3, and I will talk about it more in the next slide. Uh, 
And here is one of the intrapismic reflectors that I mapped. You know, it's a big, huge one that extends across the seismic data. And, and uh, we can observe that the fault does deform that surface, extends up to the sedimentary cover, up into the basement. And we can infer that, you know, a lot of these faults do extend deep into the basement. Most of the earthquakes in Oklahoma are occurring between 3.5 and 7 kilometers, basically within this interval. And we see that this fault that extends to the sedimentary cover do extend down to those depths. So we have a clear path of fluid flow from the sedimentary cover down into the basement. And these faults show evidence of reactivation based on um, 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 observations from the field. Here I'm showing another seismic data from Northeastern Oklahoma that I was able to work on during my PhD. And it shows that you know, similar styles of deformation from the sedimentary cover extending down into the basement. So the second question, what is the structure of this basement rooted fault? So we went a step further to take a critical look at how, how deformation is distributed vertically and a long strike of this fault to better understand um, you know, aspects of their evolution and what it might tell us about the styles of reactivation that we see in present day due to fluid injection. So here is a structure map of the top basement. So I basically mapped the top basement within my seismic data. And I also mapped the top of um, Arbuckle formation, so or group. So our Arbuckle group is this huge um, carbonate sequence that was deposited directly above the basement in the um, Ordovician during the post rift sag of the Cambrian of the field Cambrian rifting. You know, after the rifting field, there was you know subsidence, and that was when the carbonates were deposited. And they are pretty popular in Oklahoma because it it's a um, it has a lot of um, rocky spaces for fluid um, to you know, flow through. So essentially it's, it's been the major target of wastewater disposal in Oklahoma for a long time. So um, that is why, you know, that unit is important to us uh, for our study. So I mapped the top of the Arbuckle and, and that's what you see here and mapped the top of basement and that's what you see here. What we can say about these two surfaces is that they look a lot alike. Here at the top basement, we see three huge discontinuities, which we call fault F1. F2 and F3, and um, a topographic high right here. And at the top of the Arbuckle, we see a representation of the same, you know, big structures, fault F1, fault F2, fault F3, and a dome right there coinciding with the basement high. And here, um, seismic attributes, uh, co-render seismic attributes, coherence and curvature maps, and the same here for top Arbuckle. And what we see is that, you know, with a of course, with the um, attribute maps, we can image more faults. But then those three big faults are very prominent, and the basement highs also show up. The key point here is that the deformation at the basement level can be observed. The large deformations at the top basement level can be observed within the sedimentary cover uh, or the deeper sedimentary cover. Um, here, we're trying to establish that the deformation in the basement was propagated up into the sedimentary cover. And if we are trying to better understand basement deformation, we need we can we can see representations of it within the sedimentary cover itself. Right here is a zoom in into this part of fault F3, right there. And it's an attribute map. Uh, the blue represents drop, um, downward flexure, and the red represents um, anticlinal flexure across a fault. And the black discontinuity in between is the fault trace itself. And if you take a cross-section AA prime, this is what you have. And this map is from the top basement, um, top basement, yeah, right there, from right there, from the top basement map. So if we look at the seismic section across that part of the fault, fault F3, what we can say is that the top basement reflector has been offset, you know, vertically, right? But when we go up section to the top of our buckle, what we see is an offset of the top arbuckle reflector and a flexure of that reflector, which we do not see at the top basement. So essentially it appears that at top basement level, what we have is simple block faulting. But as you go up into the sedimentary cover, the style of the deformation changes into folding plus faulting. And if we go further to map other reflectors within the sedimentary cover up till 
um, reflector here in the pen, uh, within the Pennsylvanian, I do not have it. I didn't have a top to constrain the age of that or what what a particular reflector is. But for constraint on ages, I was able to constrain top what we can approximate as, as top Mississippian, which is top Chester and top Hunt in Arboco in the basement. And what we what we can say is that indeed the style of faulting does transition from simple block faulting um, at the top basement and closer to the top basement. But as you go up into the sedimentary cover, what you have is monoclinal folding and faulting right here. And further up section into the top Mississippian and, and Pennsylvania reflector where you don't even see it at all anymore. Um, what you have is primarily monoclinal folding, just you know, monoclinal, simple monoclinal folding. And the interpretation is that we have a vertical partitioning of the style of deformation um, um, within the, you know, the different domains from near the top basement up into the sedimentary cover. Another key information here is that all through the seismic data, we don't begin to see growth sequences above those basement rooted faults um, until above the top chester. You begin to see them above the top chester. And I'm showing an example right here where we have moderate thickening of the sedimentary sequences across um, the, the flexure of, of that fault. And that is a really good imp um, information because it tells us about the timing of development of that fault. So you have subsidence on the foothold of the fault, and that's why you have accommodation space creation that allows um, thickening of sediment deposition right above them. And that tells us something about the timing of activation of that fault, which we can constrain to be, you know, late Mississippian to early Pennsylvanian, which corresponds to the timing of tectonic compression in the south that led to the inversion of the southern Oklahoma or Lacogene and its uplift and the downward flexure of the Anadaco basin itself. And again, we know all this is related to the southwestward propagation of the Appalachian Wachita Marathon origin. So it, it's, it makes sense to think that this fault was probably pre-existing basement fault, but the propagation into the sedimentary cover is late Mississippian to early Pennsylvania. And um, it, this is pretty important. Also the structure of the fault is pretty important because it, it, it fits well into the category of deformation, the styles of deformation that we call fault propagation folds, which are basically folds that grow above um, a fault. And in this case, I'm talking about contractional um, deformation. So I'm not talking about normal faulting, I'm talking about reverse faulting. So essentially you have compression and you have reverse faulting, but if you have sediments sitting above the basement or even within sedimentary cover itself, you have a fault that is propagating up, the tip is propagating up, and ahead of the tip, you have monoclinal folding within a triangle zone where we have what we call tri-share tri -share deformation. And with time, as you accommodate sleep on that fault, the fold continues to grow. And when it, you know, over, um, 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 when it over thickens and there's so much steepening of the limbs, the fold can break through just because you have so much um, strain within that um, um, monoclinal part of the fold. So essentially, these are folds that grow with progressive sleep on the faults that are controlling them. In this case, we're dealing with those kind of faults that are rooted into the basement, right? And there's been many studies on this kind of faults, um, you know, right from the 1970s by Zev Rikes. However, in the case of Oklahoma, in our study area, we're not looking at faults that have just accommodated orthogonal compression, but they've accommodated an additional component. In fact, the more significant component of strike slip. In seismic sections, we can already see from the um, sections I showed you earlier that these faults have small offsets on them. You know, even at the top basement, it's just a little offset. In the sedimentary cover, you have, you know, monoclinal folding that decrease in amplitude as you go up section, right? And that tells you that there's not been a lot of vertical offsets on this fault. But these are faults that have up to, you know, more than 10 kilometers in length. A lot of them extend to 20 kilometers. And you, know, you start to imagine how, how do you, be, you know, develop a fault that are this long without so much vertical, vertical offset, simply because they've accommodated more lateral offset than vertical offsets. And the regional tectonics um, does confirm that or support that interpretation. So here we're dealing with um, 
fault propagation folds associated with faults that are rooted into the basement, but are driven by transpression and not orthogonal compression. And this is a category of fault propagation folds that are not well studied. I have dug through literature and there are very, very few studies of them and I actually highlighted two here, one by Tyndall and Davis, 1999. And I think this is on the Palisades Fault, uh, the one I'm showing here, which is in Grand Canyon. And the other one is Anderson et al, 2014, which is you know, more of a modeling paper and it was a short paper. But it's, it, it's quite important to note that um, how this fault to propagate from the basement to the sedimentary cover is not likely gonna be exactly the same um, you know, in the case of orthogonal compression versus the case of oblique comp compression. Um, I, I don't think they're gonna be the same and there's need to better understand you know, the differences between these two uh, because the orthogonal compression now, you know, types have been very well studied. Um, so here we find an opportunity to explore how transpersonal fault propagation folds propagate up into the sedimentary cover. And that's what I'm gonna be showing you in the next few slides. So what we did was we um, first quantified the distribution of vertical separation of the deformed stratigraphy um, along strike of the fault and also vertically. And then we made plots that could give us some insight into how this fault evolved. So I'm gonna take this a little slow because there are details and I don't want um, the audience to miss, to miss some of the details because it can get confusing sometimes. Um, so here is a map showing the top bit, top arbuckle and I'm highlighting faults F, F, F1, F2, and F3, but we focused on faults F1 and F2. I couldn't um, get to work on fault F3 because of the limited access I had to this data at the time that I worked on it. So here is a map showing again fault F1 and fault F2, um, and it's showing the heave of the fault. Uh, the red polygon represents the heave of the fault. So you can see the fault basically tips out, both of them tip out towards the central part and then the pickup offset again towards the south. Um, but what we did was to only study these northern sections of the fault. Uh, I think, okay, I have measurements up to the southern part of fault, fault F1 actually. So here along this fault, I was taking measurements at every two to two kilometers along the fault. And the measurements were primarily the vertical separation of the stratigraphy across the fault at, again, at every two to two kilometer interval and at all levels of um, you know, major tops that I was able to constrain in, in the data, in the sedimentary cover. So let's say at location one, L1, I have a cross section of the seismic. And what I measured was the um, offset, the vertical offset, offset of the top basement reflector, which will be just the throw because the top basement reflector does not show evidence of folding. So all I need to measure is just the throw. And I should go up into the sedimentary cover where we have faulting, um, so uh, offset and folding of the stratigraphy. Um, I also measured just the vertical separation, but it's important to mention here what that vertical separation means. So vertical separation, which is you know um, an approximate an approximation of the total fault displacement, is not just the you know clean cut offset of the stratigraphy but also has another component of ductile deformation, which is the flexure, the folding. And we cannot ignore the folding if we're trying to account for the overall vertical um, extent of the deformation of that single um, stratigraphic surface. So um, if my data had a higher resolution, you know, at all those depths, uh, I could have measured the throw, which tells me, you know, something about the brittle component of the offset and also measure um, um, the, the vertical separation, which is an addition of the throw and the ductile part and, and be able to uh, uh, piece out the ductile component of the deformation you know, by itself, which could have been amazing. You know, we can see parts of the fault systems where we have more ductile deformation than just the brittle offset and, or where we have more of the throw. But because of the issues with resolution, um, the, the, the approach to quantify the distribution of the deformation that we, that we used was just to measure the cumulative um, vertical offset of the stratigraphy, which is the vertical distance from the top of the anticlinal flexure on the hanging wall of the fault to the base of the, monoclinal, uh, of the synclinal flexure 
on the foothold of the, of the falls. So write it there. And that is what I'm going to be presenting to you in the plots. A long strike of the fault, this is what the, the distribution of the data looks like. So this is north <clears throat> and this is south for fault F1 and F2 here and F2. So what we see is that for all the stratigraphy, um, we see a systematic variation of the vertical separation from the north to south. Of course, if the data extended further north, we will see where the other segment, the other segment of the fault also tips out, right? But just as you can see with the heave here, the vertical separation does show a decrease down to zero right at that point, right there around L7, which is right here. And then it picks up again in the south. For fault F2, because I only worked on that part, we see everything decreases down to zero right at the intersection with fault F1. Um, so here again, we see a systematic you know, variation of the vertical separation. There are places where we see a sudden increase in the vertical separation of a deeper um, surface. And you will see why in the next few slides. It's a pretty important observation here. But first, we have, first, we, we wanted to establish that the vertical separation can give us a measure of the systematic distribution of deformation along this fault from bottom up in a long strike. So here is another plot showing vertical separation versus depth for at each of the locations, um, um, two kilometer interval location of measurement along the fault. And what we see is that there are two categories of trends that we see here. There are segments of the fault that show an upward decrease in vertical se separation from the top basement up section. It's like a linear decrease. And there are other areas where we have, uh, there are other locations or segments along the fault where we see um, that the highest vertical separation is within the top arbuckle. We don't see anywhere where the highest vertical separation is shallower than the arbuckle. It's like, you know, at the top arbuckle and it decreases down towards the top basement and decreases up section um, linearly. So we categorize these two, um, we differentiate between these two and we call this category propagation style one. And this other category propagation style two and I showed examples here. And how we interpret this um, is that we think this is telling us something about the styles of propagation of this basement fault when they were driven up into the sedimentary cover. We, um, you know, based on common approach in structural geology, the depth at, at which you have the highest um, um, offset of the stratigraphy uh, across a fault is inferred or interpreted to be the nucleation point of the fault and where it grew from. Because with time, as you accrue offset on that fault, that nucleation part will continue to have, you know, accrue more offset than other areas, unless you have a decoupling unit somewhere. Um, within within the stratigraphic section that you're looking at. So we can interpret that um, this category represents faults that propagated directly up from the basement up into the sedimentary cover. And this other category represents, you know, sections where we have nucleation of a fault within the sedimentary cover that propagated up and down to merge with a pre-existing fault in the basement and then up section into the sedimentary cover. And these two categories, are important because they can tell us something about the coupling of basement faulting with the shallower sedimentary sections. So we're interested in deciphering the difference in efficiency of driving deformation far up sections into, you know, shallower levels of the stratigraphy that we care about for, you know, exploration. Um, um, how can we, how can we identify fault segments or sections that might be problematic? Um, in terms of their coupling with the basement. So I decided to do a little bit of an experiment between these two styles of propagation. So I was like, okay, since we have a lot of measurement for top Chester, which is the shallowest, um, um, uh, well, not, a Pennsylvania reflector was the shallowest stratigraphy that I was able to map, but I do not have, have, it, um, have measurement for it everywhere. Um, but there are, I have a lot of, I had a lot of measurement for top Chester, a lot of measurement for top, arb top arbuckle, you know, above the basement. So I'm like, okay, if we, why don't we make a plot, a scatter plot of up vertical separation at the top arbuckle for style one and plot them against offset, their corresponding offset 
at the top Chester for style one and do the same for style two and see which one will show us a steeper slope, you know, because that tells you which one can drive um, strain further up section. So here, if uh, so this is basically the results of the plot. Um, the diamonds with the red um, boundaries represent style one, which is the directional drive of deformation from the basement, and style two represents um, fault that nucleates within the sedimentary cover. And what we see is that for um, an offset or a vertical separation of 30 meters at the top arbuckle for style two, we have only about eight meters of corresponding offset at shallower depths, uh, at top Mississippi. Whereas for style one, the one that you know is driven by basement faults up section, um, for the same magnitude of offsets at the top arbuckle, we have about 15 meters of, of offset at shallower depth at the same, you know stratigraphic level in, 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 in the shallow uh, sedimentary sections. And the interpretation of this is that it appears that basement driven transpressional propagation of deformation into the sedimentary sections is stronger for fault segments that um, have a backstop of basements at their nucleation depths. It's, it, it seems to me that if you have a steeper, a steeper um, backstop, a, steep, a steeper nucleation zone of a fault, you can drive that fault further up section than if you have, you know, a relatively less stiff um, backstop of nucleation of a fault, which is in the sedimentary cover. Y you might, you know, propagate the fault up and down, but they cannot propagate too far up section. Another thing we played with was to look at the cumulative um, um, the, to look at the along strike or along fault distribution of cumulative vertical separation along this fault. And it shows something really interesting. And I'm going to go through this quickly. What we find is that for fault F1, you know, if we plot cumulative vertical separation versus distance, we have, you know, this kind of plot, which is not too surprising in terms of display. But when we make the plot for fault F2, we found a bigger separation in the in the trend of the of the plot for the different stratigraphy, um, we see that there appears to be um, clustering of the of the curves at higher vertical separation for more matured faults. So fault F1 is it has larger offset, is a more mature, relatively more mature fault than fault F2 for sure. And you can see that even in the values of the maximum um, vertical separation. Um, however, it's it's a little bit difficult to interpret to compare these two if they have different maximum vertical separation. So uh, what I did was to normalize the values, which of course it would not make much difference because normalization is against the maximum um, 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 deformation, the maximum vertical separation here. And what we still see is, is the same general trends in that with a, more, uh, with a less mature fault, you have this gap of vertical separation between the deeper stratigraphy and the shallower strat sorry between the sh deeper stratigraphy and the shallower stratigraphy but for a more mature fault it appears that the curves cluster together within the same intervals the deepest ones still have a little bit of separation there but overall there is more <clears throat> um, closeness of the of the curves compared to the to a less mature fault and what this means is that it, it, this is basically telling us about the progression of uh, block faulting at depth to you know simple monoclinal folding at shallower depth in the strat in sedimentary sections for younger fault, relatively younger fault or relatively less mature fault, uh, which are low offset faults. But as you as these faults grow and accumulate more offsets, what happens is that the sections at shallower depth that were initially you know folded you know, the fault tips propagate up into those sections and you begin to have, you know, a contribution of brittle offset to the monoclinal flexure, which gives you even more um, um, vertical separation. So essentially at the earlier stages of development of those faults, there is a very significant separation in the magnitudes of offset at shallower depth versus deeper depth. And with time, when you have more coupling of deformation across the section, basically fault offset and folding together, you, you begin to homogenize the, 
distribution of deformation of offsets a little more than than before. So we think this we think this this distribution can tell us something about the relative magnet uh, extents of maturity of the faults. And here is just a cartoon that summarizes what we think happened um, with this fault, basically how they evolved over time on a large scale. We think that these faults are pre-existing basement faults that were most likely in place perhaps during the 1.21 giga and mid-continent rifting in the region. And then we have you know, uh, another phase of rifting in the south, um, which failed. And then we have post-rift subsidence that allowed um, deformation of sediment. Of course, this should depend on planation of this stratigraphy of the basement. The top basement is a national conformity. So, and it's well known, it's what we call the great unconformity. But then in the early Paleozoic, there was deposition of the post-rift um, sediment. And then in the late Paleozoic, we think there was transpressional reactivation of those faults, which led to the present the structure that we see. Okay, so what does this mean for induced seismicity? Um, and I'm going to just show you this single slide, which summarizes another study that um, I worked with Swetha Patel on um, during my PhD. And the takeaway message from here is that we tested different seismic attributes that could help image faults within the sedimentary cover, particularly between Haunton and Chester, um, the target sedimentary sections for conventional development. Um, of unconventional exploration and production here in, in uh, Anadako Basin. Um, and we found that the, the um, attributes that showed faults the best were the ones that were sensitive to flexure. So attributes like coherence is sensitive to displacement and offsets, you know, separation of the continuation of, of, of the seismic reflectors. But there are attributes like, um, like coverture, and aberrancy that are very, very sensitive to flexure of the stratigraphy and less sensitive to discontinuity, you know, like coherences. And we found out that, you know, this kind of um, 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 attribute, the flexurally sensitive attributes were more effective in highlighting this fault. And it's simply because of the origin of the faults, because of the distribution of deformation from the top basement up into the sedimentary cover. You typically have more monoclinal folding at shallower depths. So it, this does not mean that these monoclines do not have fractures in them, or we cannot see them at the scale of the seismic. However, if you're trying to map these faults using attributes, um, what, you know, how can you tell if a lineament is actually a fault or not? You know, we think the flexurally sensitive attributes can highlight you know, the lateral continuity of this lineament that in cross-section could correspond to faults in the basement. And, and that that can be explained by this, the um, evolution of the fault in terms of their upward propagation. So the conclusion from my presentation is that one, the inherent, inherited basement structure of the Northern Oklahoma, uh, in Northern Oklahoma records multiple episodes of deformation that have been placed, the faults that have been reactivated today. And second, the styles of upward propagation of the basement rooted faults have implications for coupling of deformation between the shallower sedimentary sections and the basement. And third, flexurally sensitive structure oriented seismic attributes are more useful for delineating fault zones at shallower sedimentary levels, which could potentially help um, earthquake mitigation efforts. I would like to thank Chesapeake Energy and TGS for giving me the opportunity to work on this data and do this project. So this was a project I worked on um, during my internship in 2019 at Chesapeake Energy. And uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work on this beautiful data and publish this work. And here are papers that are published on my studies on in Oklahoma in, in terms of looking at the structural um, inheritance, the influence of structural inheritance on on, on, on the patterns of seismicity that we're seeing today. And all the um, um, information that are presented today are also um, in these two, mostly in these two papers. And I'd like to finish my presentation by highlighting the you know, big challenges that we're facing with geosciences, um, especially in the US, the fact that we, there is lack of diversity. And it's pretty obvious in the data that we have a lot of gap to fill in terms of both the gender and um, ethnic diversity in the US. Um, I think it's a big problem and we all need to keep it at the back of our mind because I think it's a loss to science if we do not see all the perspectives that bring talents to um, advancing what we care about in science. 
and I can also talk about NABG. Um, it's a great place where um, young Black scientists come together to share science and get mentorship. And it's a place where companies and schools can target talent um, you know, to, to, to hire into their teams. Thank you for listening. And here are my contacts. If you have more um, questions for me or you want to chat with me about anything um, up after this presentation, and I hereby welcome questions. Thank you, Fala. That was awesome. Um, I love seeing your work, and I'm really excited to see what all you're going to be doing in the future. I'm definitely going to be following you. Um, Thank you. And I love your website, by the way. If, if you want to learn all about his research, check out his website listed there. Um, awesome job. We did have a couple of questions come in. And if you guys have more questions at the bottom of your Zoom screen, I think you'll see a little button that says Q&A. Feel free to type something in there um, and then I'll ask it for Fola to answer. Uh, there might be a way for you to raise your hand as well and we might see if we can unmute you if you wanna ask out loud. Um, but the first one, so let me start with actually the second one here. So what are the possible mechanisms that could control the fault orientations for like fault one, two, and three that we saw in that seismic data? Ah, okay. So I will try to answer that question, say here. So possible mechanisms that can explain how they formed. So first, you know, we think all these faults were pre-existing faults in the basement that got reactivated and propagated up into the sedimentary cover. Um, but perhaps in terms of their orientation, we can think about the possible stress fields within which they formed and timing. And I will say, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an important question and it's difficult to answer because there are alternative answers that could be valid, could be, because there's no strong constraint on ages. But in terms of orientation, the fact that these faults are, you know, F1 is approximately not south and F2 is not north um, east, I can almost see a correlation with the mid-continent rifts right there. Like oh, perhaps they were first in place during the evolution of the mid-continent rift in, you know, 1.1 giga an, around 1.1 giga an. Um, but then you have F3 that strikes north, um, west, southeast. Perhaps F3 is related to rifting in southern Oklahoma because it's parallel to that trend. These are speculations just based on orientations, right? But uh, in relation to their reactivation and propagation of section, uh, there's clear evidence that all this fault, even though they are different orientations, were propagated up into the sedimentary cover during the late Paleozoic. I think that that is um, common knowledge. Um, however, in terms of the orientation of stresses that drove their propagation up and their emplacement in the sedimentary cover, I would refer back to, you know, Molly and Mitra's paper that showed that during the late uh, uh, Paleozoic, there was an initial phase of Northeast compression, which would um, throw a fault like F3 into orthogonal reverse faulting. But then F1 and F2 would likely be accommodating, you know, oblique transpression in that kind of you know stress field because they are you know sub they are oblique to the to the direction of compression and perhaps when the stress stresses um, the sh max rotated which is your sigma one in that case rotated to is not east orientation um in you know lit, lit pennsylvania that would throw f3 into transpression and f1 and f2 into uh, more orthogonal compression so that's the best explanation I can give right now, you know, to how this fault, this, you know, different orientation of faults were in place. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that that was really well explained there. In Oklahoma, we have a lot of different tectonic events that really kind of set up our basement fabric. So lots of different opportunities. Um, another question. This was near the beginning. You had like one of your introductory slides on the Anadarko Basin and this question popped up. Do you know what the vertical exaggeration was on those seismic lines? It was from Marfer, one of his papers and then Liao, Lao, L-I-A-O. Okay. Um, I don't know if you have a, a ballpark uh, guess. I know those were from the literature. 
So that would be this, right? Yes. Yeah, that's when this question popped up. Okay. I cannot remember. So I worked on this, and this has been a long time ago. I do not know. And for this one, I wasn't part of the study, so I also do not know. Unfortunately, the sections are in time, so <laughs> it's difficult to tell. Yeah, yeah that's okay. No, uh, I, I'd say ballpark almost five times. Five times we eat, okay. I think. Yeah, you are more you know, familiar with regional um, you know, line, <laughs> lines in Oklahoma, so you can tell if something looks this bumped up, probably five times. Yeah, I would not be surprised. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, another question. This was from slide 16, but it okay. says, it looks like there's about 200 meters of additional Paleozoic parallel section below what you are calling the basement reflector. Is that reflector actually a near basement reflector used for mapping, but is actually not the true stratigraphic basement. Okay. I think that question, okay, the, the, the person answering the question is saying that this here, this um, zero cross in here below the brown is more representative of top basement. Um, and the answer is, I think it's a no. I think this is the top basement, and this is constrained by well data. But the, I believe the reason why the person is asking the question is, so why should your top basement um, be a, a positive, you know, reflector? Why should it? Why should you have um, a positive reflection coefficient there, um, or positive acoustic impedance? It's basically suggesting that. Um, so I, I do I have a slide on that here? No, I don't. So so what we found. Um, so actually, no, no, okay, so it's, hmm, okay. I know that the arbuckles have, there are places where the arbuckle has, has um, higher um, velocities than the granitic basement itself. And we think it's because the basement has been fractured. Um, the top basement, shallow basement level has been fractured a lot. And there are places where the basement has higher velocities. But in most places, what we see is high velocities in the arbuckle. But perhaps that is not useful here to answer that question. I do agree, yes, um, with the person. This is the top basement. And um, I mapped that zero crossing as a representation of the top basement to give me the, a better picture. Yeah, I remember now that. So the person is right. Yes, there is an additional section there. But I did map zero crossing. Uh, because I needed a better picture of, of, the, of the top basement reflector. And it's difficult, it, it difficult mapping the top basement right there, um, you know, between the brown and this blue. So yeah, this is the top basement. And do, I, I remember because the top basement is a negative reflection coefficient because in many places, because the, we see that the arbuckle has a higher velocity than the basement in many wells. Yeah, yes, I've seen that too. Um, I have kind of a, a comment question. Maybe you can expand on this. So I know like in Oklahoma, a lot of our earthquakes are several meters or more even below the top of basement. And I think you've done a lot of work with Dr. Carpenter looking at, you know, some of our basement fabric. Can you comment about some of like the basement fractures and things you've seen in the basement and how how does that fluid or that pressure get so deep down there? Do you have any thoughts or comments on that? That is a good question. So what we've seen, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, let me see if there's a picture. Okay, so I can start with this. So the question is how, how does fluids from the sedimentary cover go deep down into the basement? Like is there information from the fracture distribution at shallow abysmal levels that can tell us about that. So what we found, so there was a paper um, that we published early last year that um, involved you know, data from the from basement core, cores in North, Northern Oklahoma. We assembled you know, a lot of basement cores that we could lay our hands on and looked at the distribution of fractures and deformation in the geochemistry of the alterations of those fractures. And what we see is that at shallow basement, there's a lot of filling of the basement, of the basement fractures. Basically, you have lots of veins, calcites and epidote veins, occluding a lot of those fractures. 
um, but we see less of those as you go deeper into the basement. And this core is about 150 meters long, uh, you know, into the basement. It's not, so it, it, it is a valid question, you know, that how, how do fluids go from the sedimentary cover into the deeper basement when you have less opening based on available data, right? That does not mean that we don't have opening at all. That is not field. And what I think is this, I think <clears throat> first the cores were are vertical, right? They are vertical cores, which means that it's most likely gonna be difficult to intersect so vertical faults, mm -hmm. you know, the such wells will intersect mostly deep in faults. Um, so I do not think that those cores um, uh, contains information about so vertical faults, right? That's one. Two, I think most of the fault, most of the pathways for fluid flow from the sedimentary cover into the basement are most likely confined to this major fault and not necessarily you know, the many fractures at the shallow abasements up here in northern Oklahoma. Um, the many fractures tell us about the orientations of all the faults, you know, both the big and the small ones, um, you know, but do they tell us about the pathways for fluid flow in present day? Most likely not. Do they tell us about pathways for fluid flow in the past? Yes, because we can see the veining, right, in those fractures. So I think the the fluid flow into the basement from the sedimentary cover is most likely confined to this bigger fault that the cores are probably not um, um, targeting. And remember that there's the other mechanism of remote, uh, remote reactivation of this fault. So you can, can inject a lot of fluids up here into the sedimentary cover. And even if they're not going down um, into the basement, if they are confined to the R buckle, Within that zone of injection, you are loading, you're creating a load, a confined load above the basement that can change the loading, uh, the stress loading conditions on the pre-existing fault. And that those kind of mechanism can also create remote reactivation of the fault. Of course, where's the fault gonna reactivate? That is not necessarily like which part of the fault um, are you gonna see earthquake nucleation? That's primarily related to frictional stability of the fault itself and the depths where you have, you know, the perfect favorable temperature, pressure, and geochemical conditions that allow earthquakes to nucleate frictional, you know, frictional processes to nucleate. So um, it's, not, it's not surprising that we see a lot of earthquakes at certain depths in the basement. And we dealt with this in my nature paper, um, the Colau 2019. It has to do with the frictional stability conditions on fault. But where you have the drive of fluid pressurization due to fluid flow, uh, fluid you know, migration into the basement, um, is different from where you have a drive of remote triggering by pre-elastic stresses or static stress transfer. So I hope I, I know I yeah. said a lot there, but I hope I answered the questions. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I know you worked a lot on it. And so I just wanted to kind of hear your thoughts about it. I, I've read the papers, but nothing like, yeah. you know, hearing it from the people who worked on it. I agree. Um, well, that was really awesome. I don't see any more questions and we're just a little bit after one o'clock. I don't want to take any more time, but Thank you so much for coming to present to us today. We really appreciate it. And we're gonna upload this to YouTube. Um, so check out our AAPG PSGD YouTube page, like it and subscribe it, like our videos. Um, and thank you again, Fola. I, it was so great seeing you again. Absolutely, and me too. Look forward to all that you're gonna do soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Fola. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, team. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.